Houseplants are celebrated for their amazing foliage, but plant friends, I think we are overlooking another amazing ability of a specific subcategory of our favorite indoor plants, the ability to freaking grow flowers. I have a whole chapter in my book, Growing Joy, on the power of flowers and how a beautiful red, pink, or purple blossom can literally uplift and change your day and mood. Some people even say that we're intrinsically connected to flowers and like being around them because way back when, they actually signified fruit or food. Personally, I just think Being in the presence of flowers is joyful as hell. This is the first year that I'm growing cut flowers and I couldn't be enjoying it more. I love my blooming houseplants. And let's be frank, plant friends, we all need a little bit of more joy in our lives these days, so why not grow plants that bloom? Lots of common houseplants that bloom can also be thought of as your grandma's houseplants, but today I'm going to share a story about how reconnecting with this group of plants we discussed today can actually help us reconnect to generations we might never know. So welcome to this fabulous conversation about houseplants that bloom on Bloom and Grow Radio. Welcome back. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Oh my gosh. I am so high vibe. I'm having so much fun in this growing season. Billy and I are eating. If you've read my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Plants and Happiness, you know that I have a whole story about tomato plants and our first failed tomato plant with me and my husband, Billy. And this year we've got six really happy and healthy tomato plants. Billy and I are eating tomatoes every day right off the vine. It's been so much fun. I've loved my grow bag garden. My house plants are thriving. Finally, it feels like things are turning around a little bit, which is nice. And speaking of me being high vibe and learning lessons from my plants in every, you know, every turn, I just wrote a whole book about plant care and self-care. This episode is, is perfectly timed because I just had a very emotional thing happen that actually is all around blooming house plants. It's a bit of a long story, so I'm going to save it to tell to you until after this interview in case you just showed up to the interview and you're not interested in all of my stories. But if you're interested in how I think we can use this subject of house plants that bloom to connect with other generations and a very emotional thing that happened to me that had me in tears earlier today, ironically. I can't wait to tell you the story about my family in about 55 minutes. So we love Lisa from Houseplant Guru. She's a repeat guest on Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm sure you've listened to other episodes with her. And she's recently come out with a new book. It's called Bloom, The Secrets of Growing Flowering Houseplants Year-Round. And this book, it's so cute. It celebrates the beloved plants we can grow for blooms in addition to foliage. Lisa and I cover a lot of ground, so let's dive in. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Yay. So excited, you know, author to author now that I'm an author too, to celebrate your fourth book. What a huge accomplishment. Thank you. And congratulations on your book. I think I can't wait to read it. Oh, good. Thank you. I can't wait to send you a copy, but you know, in doing research for my book, I started learning more about flowers. And this is the first year that I started a cut flower garden. I have 25 grow bags on my balcony and I'd say seven of them are cut flowers. I'm turning into like a flower mama. I'm obsessed with with growing flowers outdoors. So when I heard about the topic of your next book, I got so excited because I feel like people think about flowers and growing flowers, specifically only outdoors. And you have a whole book now dedicated to how to grow blooming plants indoors. So thank you for creating this book to teach us all how to enjoy that, that joy of you know growing flowers outdoors, but inside. Thank you. I'm, I love flowers. Uh, right now in my house, I have Phalaenopsis orchids blooming. I have Hoyas that smell so good at night. And I just noticed yesterday, yesterday when I was watering, because it's like 100 degrees in Michigan today, I have six blooms on my Epiphyllum oxypetalum, my, <gasps> my queen of the night. I, she oh. just bloomed and now she's blooming again. I'm so excited. I'm going to try to get a time lapse of it this time. I talk about a special experience I had with my queen of the night in the final chapter of my book. She's never bloomed for me. I mean, she's small. She's a little division, but I'm waiting for that moment of her blooming for me. I had it for years before it bloomed. A friend gave it to me. She heard, it bloomed all the time in her kitchen, just in her kitchen, in, in her home. Like, you know, I think it was a West window and I had it in the South window, never bloomed, but I move it out to my sunroom in the corner and it's a Southwest window and it, but it does get burnt a little bit. It's a little too much light, but it bloomed, it's bloomed for two years now, but it took, I've had it forever. So be patient. (laughs) 
If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. So I think that houseplant parents tend to be, you know, tropical foliage people. But when I was doing research for my book, I mean, it's really interesting. There's there's a real connection between humans and flowers. People argue that when we were in our caveman era, you know, way, 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 way back in the day, flowers signaled food. And so we have this intrinsic excitement kind of in our bodies around them. And there is something about, you know, when you see a beautiful flower and you're just naturally going to smile, whether it's a cut flower or whether it's a, it's in a plant. And I love the idea of flowering plants coming back into vogue. I mean, I feel like African violets were, you know, your grandma's plant, but Leslie Halleck and I have been joking that we've been trying to get the African violet to come back into popularity for years because it's like such an underrated plant. If you ever go to the, I think it was, I don't know if it's an international convention or just the national convention was last couple of weeks, I think it was last week or the week before. If you guys could see, if people could see the African violets, these people grow that are as big around as garbage can lids. And you can't even see the foliage because of the flowers. You would change in the colors and the varieties. You would change your mind. And the cool thing with flowering houseplants too, like African violets, is once you get it in its sweet spot, like once you figure out what it needs, it will just keep blooming for you. I mean, I remember my little African violet, once I figured out getting it under the grow light, watering it appropriately, it would just nonstop bloom. And it was always so fun to see the blooms in all states from bud to full expansion to like, you know, kind of the, the droopiness of it too, where there's like a, there's an art and, and poetry in that as well. So as we dive in, let's talk about the difference between the normal foliage houseplants that we know and love and these blooming houseplants. Well, I think the difference is they're going to need a little more light. Like if you really definitely only have like a North window and you have no light, then you're probably not going to have a lot of flowering houseplants, right? But, but you can, you can grow anything under grow lights. I mean, I'm, I've got so much stuff blooming under my grow lights right now. And they're just, you know, common LED lights, like from a shot, you know, a shot looks like a shop light and there's just myriads of plants, but uh, the foliage is beautiful. Sometimes I use that hashtag who needs flowers, right? Some of this foliage on these calatheas and these aeroids, they're beautiful. But if you can have both, why not? If you can have flowers and good foliage, I'm all for it. Yeah. and. I feel like there's only so much you can, in terms of variety and color that you can do with foliage. I mean, yes, there are some foliage plants that are purple and pink and that kind of stuff, but those tend to be more expensive. And if you want to add different textures and colors into your kind of plant collection as a whole, a simple orchid or a simple peace lily or, you know, a simple flowering plant that tends to be a little bit more affordable, that's a really easy way to just add some more dimension to your plant collection as well. I totally agree. I mean, when I walk out into my sunroom at night, I have to close the doors, you know, because it's, I leave them open during the day because it's real hot out there. And I smell those flowers. I mean, I can't wait till the epiphyllum blooms. It's going to smell like heaven. Right now I have a Hoya that smells good. I have a a Sansevieria. It's the most unattractive. I love Sansevieria. I collect them. Excuse me, (laughs) Dracinias. And I have so many and there's one out there that blooms. And when it blooms, it comes open at night and the whole, I have, the sunroom is pretty big. It smells, one little stalk smells the whole like first floor of the house. It's amazing. I mean, just for that alone. I smelled my first, um, or I smelled the coconut orchid for the first time last month. And it was in this random greenhouse I found up here in the middle of nowhere in the Catskills. And, um, 
man, that scent is it like accosts you in the most delightful way. It was so fragrant, otherwise known as the pina colada orchid. It's the coconut. orchid. Oh, there you go. I have not smelled that one or I have smelled the chocolate one at the orchid shows. But yeah, I mean, even if they don't flower, I mean, or don't smell, they're still I mean, it's just so much beauty. I can't I and I'm so excited in my book. We were talking about African violets. My grandma always had a whole shelf of them. And she'd taken pictures of them and they, I said, I'd like to put that picture in there, but it's from like 19, whatever, Mm -hmm. 70, 60, whatever, just a little old, you know, her little codex, little camera. And they, I scanned it and it's in the introduction. Here's my grandma's. And I remember that. I know. I love it too. She would loved her African violets. My nanny loved geraniums. That's my memory of her is seeing her sunroom filled with geraniums. And also I have a very deep sense memory with the scent of geranium because of that. But yeah, she always had all sorts of pelargoniums in all sorts of different states. So yeah, those flowers can like for that, we're just telling, showing people that that also brings back. I mean, every time I see an African violet, I think of my grandma. So, and it's such good memories. So plants can also bring back good memories. Absolutely. So the main difference, if we want to start caring for blooming houseplants is that we need to have a good light set up. I think so. Yes. You need more light. Usually they're not saying always, like obviously a croton needs as much light as any plant you could ever want. Right. But as a rule, flowering plants need a little more light. Yeah. So that's going to look like a Southern facing window, a Western facing window, maybe an Eastern window, depending on what obstruction. If you've got Northern facing windows, you're going to need to supplement with the grow light. There's so many different grow lights out there. I mean, I think a a, a spathophyllum lily could definitely, you know, bloom in a North window. And some people have had like cyclamen and African violet, but I, I feel like they're not, it's just not straight North light. You know, maybe there's a white house that's reflecting in, or it's a little bit facing East or something, but yeah, there's not much that will bloom in a North window. And is that it? Because technically all of our plants, all of our tropical house plants can bloom like the monstera can bloom. It does have fruit. Correct. It's just that we're not giving it enough light in order to successfully bloom. Right. And also it has to be mature. Like I tell people, if your plant is not blooming, everything is cyclical, right? So if your plant is not blooming, like a Phalaenopsis orchid, if it doesn't bloom within a year, Mm -hmm. because every plant's going to bloom within a year, a year's time, sometime. And if it's not, then you, it it needs something different, probably more light, you know, but it could be that it's not mature enough yet. Plants have to mature. Like if you grow a a citrus from seed, it's not going to flower for six to seven years. But if you get a cutting from a mature plant, it could bloom on this little tiny cutting because it's mature. So that makes a difference too. Got it. And with light, what are we looking at? If we have a grow light, what's the timing that comes into that? Are we running it for 12 hours? Are we running it? It, Well, it definitely depends on the light. And I am certainly not a light expert, but my LED lights, I found I was running them too long. My plants were getting bleached out, not my cacti and succulents, but I kind of grow everything under my lights, you know, on the same stand. I got African violets over here and Hoyas over there. So my African violets, it was getting too much light. So they're only like, I think I have it on for seven or eight hours. Whereas if I had fluorescent, I had those on for 12 hours, sometimes more. So just, I think it depends on the light, but most people are going to LEDs now. So I wouldn't say it ever needs to be on more than probably 12 hours at the very most, depending on the plant. Got it. What about photo period when it comes to plants? Because I know that there's long day plants, short day plants, neutral plants, and that kind of affects the bloom cycle. So can you walk us through like the bloom cycle of a plant and what we need to know about it in order to kind of be as effective as possible? Right. So if if a plant is day neutral, that's like an African violet. It can bloom. Like you said, it blooms all the time, all year long. But if it's if it's a short day plant, then it's going to start blooming in when, when the nights get longer, it's really about night. It's not really about the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's how much dark they need. So, you know, your poinsettias, your kalanchoe, you sometimes cycle cyclamen. They're little short day plants. Chrysanthemums outside, they bloom in the fall because they want long nights, which is weird, isn't it? And then if you have something like our annuals, most of our annuals outside, like snapdragons and marigolds and all that, they're long day. They need as much light for as long as possible to bloom. Mm-hmm. So in the house, you have to, you know, most, most of them I'm looking around are, you know, they just, mostly it's, it's all about light, enough light, right. Mm -hmm. And that length of light. So our blooming house plants, do they all fall under one category or they're, they're all different? Oh no, I I would say they're different. I'm not really sure about short day, but I find like my um, Tillandsias can bloom almost all the time. I mean, there's always one of those in bloom around here. My little like Tillandsias. 
So I'm, I'm thinking that's day neutral. Violets are day neutral. My orchids all bloom usually in the spring, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, they start blooming. If I have phalaenopsis that have been over, you know, I have them from years past, they're going to start blooming. They're all blooming right now, but they started a couple months ago. So it just depends on the- You have your orchids under grow lights too? I put them near, like, I I think the phalaenopsis really doesn't need that much, but they're kind of, I'm not going to say they're unattractive because I don't think a plant's unattractive. They're just, you know, when they're not in bloom, it's not all that. I have more plants I could put there instead. So I put them near my plant stand. They go in that room and they're kind of on the floor in front of it. So they don't have to be directly on earth. That's, you know, they're kind of like African violets. They could take an east window and it'd be just fine. If you can grow an African violet, you can grow a phalaenopsis orchid. Yeah. My mom just moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, there's orchids in the trees. Like everybody in Florida, like basically mounts orchids in their trees outdoors. And it looks so cool. Yes. Because that's really where they, that's what, that's how they naturally grow, right? They grow outdoors in real life. Yeah. So that's why we're, we're putting them in that bark, you know, that full, they're, they're in a potting mix. That's not, their roots can have lots of air because, yeah. you know, when they're on that tree, they're getting rain, yeah. but then they're drying out, you know, and then rain. So they don't want to be sitting in water by any stretch. Yes. Okay. So we talked about light. So you got to make sure if you want blooming houseplants, you got to set your plants up for success with light. What about fertilizing? Because I feel like with the MPK and with, I feel like all these fertilizers that are like bloom booster, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So, so what do we need to know about fertilizing if we want to grow houseplants that bloom? Well, I think I'm not always the most consistent fertilizer or (laughs) side of the bird, but I try to be with my flowering houseplants, but people come up to me all the time and like, you know, my plant's not blooming. I, I, so I gave it some fertilizer. Fertilizer is great. It's, I mean, it's all, it's like us taking vitamins. It's not food for your plant. That's only the sun can feed your plant. Right. So Look at the, when you, I'm glad you said that. When you look at the container, it says bloom booster. It makes your blooms uh, last longer, maybe makes them bigger, more vibrant, but it doesn't make your plant bloom. The only thing that can make your plant bloom or help your plant to bloom is sun. But a healthy plant, obviously, goes a long way to helping that as well. If you've got a really unhealthy plant and it's in the right sun, it may just be sending flowers out to try to, you know, make more of itself before it, you know, dies. So but it is important to fertilize. And I try to use a fertilizer that's kind of for that plant. And I really don't use the bloom booster, to be honest. I just use 20, 20, 20. Okay. But when you do see something that is marketed as bloom, that's because it has more. Oh, the middle number and PK. Um, phosphorus. Phosphorus. Thank you. Yes. And that's for roots and blooms, right? It's okay. For healthy roots. And then it, it helps the blooms. But like I said, it just helps them. It doesn't make them. So if you have a plant that's not blooming, fertilizer is not going to, it's going to help make a healthier plant, but it's not going to make your plant bloom. Yeah. I feel like an interesting way of thinking about fertilizing and by the way, like definitely fertilize your plants, but it's like, if you have two people with identical homes and an identical plant and one person deprives the plant of light for five years and one person deprives the plant of fertilizer for five years that plant deprived of light will be dead. The plant deprived of fertilizer might just be sad, but like, right. Do you know what I mean? That's right. Cause, That's I'm, a- cause I'm not, I'm not going to tell like my, out in my sunroom, I water that with a hose that I hook up to my laundry room sink. Cause there's so many plants out there. And I wouldn't say if they get fertilized once or twice a year, I'm lucky it, yeah. really. And they're all doing just fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, they probably, maybe they'd be better, but maybe I don't want them to be they're already, there's already no room out there. So let's not make them any bigger. Than yeah. Are, right. Yeah. So it, they will live. Okay. I want to ask you about, I have like a love hate relationship with orchids. Personally, I really struggle with them. And what I've realized with my houseplant collection is I need to treat everyone the same way. I can't have you know, I had some plants in semi-hydro and I ended up killing the plants in semi-hydro because I would forget, like, I need everyone to be on the same schedule or like <laughs> with not the same schedule. Cause obviously don't water all your plants at the same time if they don't need watering. But like, I kind of need everyone on the same page. Once I start getting too specific, then I either forget about them or i spend too much time on them. And then I forget about the rest of my plants. And it like, right. that's just what's working for me lately. It's like, I kind of just need a nice low maintenance plant. And I feel like orchids, I've just never gotten over that like initial hump. 
But let's talk about orchids for a bit, because I will say that's probably one of the big questions I get is why isn't my orchid blooming? And my answer is always like, I have no idea. (laughs) Well, I would, I, and I would say that it's light. See, like I have, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six orchids, you know, right here on this table. My husband's like, why, why? It needs the right light, but also you have to, every, at least two years, you need to completely repot it. You know, you need to, that needs new bark because this bark is breaking down. Or if it's in sphagnum moss, that's breaking down because everything's, comp- I tell everybody, every, everything's composting. Everything's deteriorating. Mm-hmm. Just like, just like me. <laughs> we all are, right? We're all changing. So it's decomposing and then it's, it gets more compact and then your plant's not getting enough air. The roots aren't getting enough air. So with phalaenopsis, it's the right light, but it's also, it needs to be repotted at least every second year. Okay. And fresh compost. Okay. Fresh orchid bark, like an orchid mix. Correct. I know yes. orchids also need their own situation. They need their own orchid mix. I actually right. find lately, you know, I have the Espoma organic orchid mix and I don't use it. Well, I don't use it for my orchids because I don't have any orchids, but I like folding it into my potting mix because I feel Me like too. that orchid mix is the perfect thing to aerate a potting mix for more, you know, um, more aeration for the, for the roots for, yeah. For epiphytic plants. That was the word I was looking right. for. Right. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah, Hoyas, I, I've, I've, I've been starting to do that too. I had never thought about it before. But yeah, you see some of these mixes, and I'm like, that's kind of a good idea. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Soltech Solutions and Espoma Organic. Plan friends, the sun is out, but you know, the sun can't reach every part of your home. What if you have a basement office or an entertainment room that has no windows? What if your home just gets poor natural light? Enter Soltex Solutions, one of my favorite grow lights, a plant light that lets you grow any plant anywhere without limitations. Soltex Solutions has got you covered with their full spectrum photosynthetic plant lights that give off a warm white glow, often called museum quality. No more dead plants or harsh looking grow lights. You can keep any plant in your home without having to look at ugly grow lights all winter. Soltex sleek and modern plant lights make sure that your plants are getting the proper amount of light all year round while fitting seamlessly into your home decor. And plant friends, if you know me, if you listen to this podcast, you know I am obsessed with Soltech Solutions. I have three of their pendant lights, which are called the Aspect Light. I'm waiting to get their track lighting in my next home. And I have the Vitus grow bulb that they have that I just screwed into a desk lamp in my office. They are fabulous grow lights. I can't recommend them enough. And in addition to that, they have great customer service, free shipping, and a five-year warranty. So keep the sun shining and the plants green inside your home with Soltech Solutions. Check them out at soltechsolutions.com and get 15% off with code BLOOM15. Once again, that's soltechsolutions.com and get 15% off with code BLOOM15. Plan friends, we know I love Espoma Organics. They are a family owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We are deep into the growing season, which means we got to talk about feeding. Plant friends, I have been using the Espoma liquid fertilizers every time I water my grow bag garden right now, and my plants are so happy. And the liquid fertilizers that they have make fertilizing so freaking easy easy. They've got 16 ounce liquid fertilizers containers. It's almost like detergent. So they come in these nice little bottles and the cap is the measuring, you know, the measuring cap. So you just pour it into the cap. You dump it in your watering can. You don't have to get worried about measuring, about granules. It's already liquid. It's organic and it's fabulous. I use their tomato liquid fertilizer on my tomato plants, the Bloom liquid fertilizer on my flowers, and the Grow liquid fertilizer on my houseplants. They also have an indoor houseplant option if you want that. And in addition to the liquid fertilizer, they also have all sorts of granular fertilizers for basically like any type of plant you could ever dream of. It's called their line of tones. This line of fertilizer has been around for 85 years. It's filled with long lasting organic ingredients that break down slowly every time you water if you don't want to deal with liquid fertilizer. Like I said, they literally have a tone for anything you're growing from garden tone, berry tone, rose tone, azalea tone, bloom tone. Any type of tone, they've got it. Whatever you're growing, they've got an organic fertilizer for you. So to learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to visit my Espoma Amazon storefront for my curated list of favorites. 
Okay. So with orchids, so yeah, just like a quick troubleshooting of like, I bought an orchid at the grocery store in bloom. I brought it home. It bloomed for a while. The blooms died. I cut the spike off. How do I get it to rebloom? I'm putting it in more light. I think, I think more light. If it's not, if, like I said, if it's not blooming and that whole, if it doesn't come back into bloom, I think sometimes people think things are going to bloom right away too. Like it's always going to be in bloom if I'm taking care of it correctly, Mm -hmm. but they also have seasons of bloom. My orchids all bloom. They start blooming again. They're blooming right now and they've been blooming for a couple months. So they all in the, in the spring, that's when all the orchid shows are too. Does that make sense? Right. That makes sense. That's when you can, they have the orchid shows and sales because everything's in bloom. So a lot of things it's cyclical. So you have to, you have to be patient. If you're giving it the right light, it should throw out a, a spike the next year and repotting it in a timely manner. Isn't there a cold thing too? Aren't you supposed to like make it cold? I, I don't with my, my orchids. They're upstairs and they don't, I mean, there might be some, like, I'm like, I'm telling you right now, I'm growing phalaenopsis orchids and I have a few miniatures that grow well. But other than that, I'm not growing in, and I have a symbi- I don't have a symbidium. I have a dendrobium. Other than that, I'm not really growing a lot of orchids because you're right. They do take different, they have different needs and I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no shade though. I love an orchid. I appreciate an orchid. I almost bought that coconut orchid so quick, but then I stopped myself because I was like, Maria you're going to kill it. Like, don't, this isn't the plan for you. You just enjoy the smell and walk away. Uh, you're so good at that. See, I just buy it and then it comes home. And if you could, if I could add up the money of plants I've killed, I'd probably be on some great vacation someplace, <laughs> you know? You also own your home and live in your own home. I've been pretty, I've moved three times in the last year. So I also feel like I reevaluate every time I bring a plant home. I'm like, okay, but am I going to move with this again? Like uh, that's no, that's true. We lived here for 24 years. I'm like, if I had to move, John, my husband's like, we are never moved. Never moved. I, I, I don't just collect plants. I collect a lot of things. So yeah, we don't, I don't want to move. I've told Billy that too. Once we buy our house, I'm like, it's it. We're, we're not buying a starter house. We're buying a forever home because I can't do this. any. I can't keep moving. I agree with that. You know what? I wish I had, this would have been my, would have been my starter home because then you can, I'm an outdoor gardener too. So then I could have planted the trees and I mean, I do have a ginkgo that's grown huge since I've lived here, but you know, I could have had more, you know, I could have watched things grow. Yes. Yes. And I'm like, you know, I'm having fun in these grow bags, you know, like a real psycho. I've got so many grow bags on these balconies that I have, which is amazing. But I'm like, man, I would have loved to, I, I actually did. I gifted my landlord cause I'm renting. I planted, if you, we want to talk about flowers, I planted a deer resistant perennial pollinator garden in my front yard. I got permission from my landlord. It came out so cute. I'm obsessed. I with saw it. it. It's very nice. And deer resistant is the key. I just put a huge begonia, like a, I took a hanging basket and put it in a pot because it was enormous, you know, huge pot. It was beautiful. This trailing begonia, I put it in the shade and I came and I sprayed it, but it rained. It's been a while since I sprayed it and it rained. He, the deer ate all of it. Yeah. All of it. Rude. These deer are oh my rude. Gosh. They ate everything. I'm so, I was so, he did it last year too. My, my daughter's like, didn't you learn the lesson last year? I go, but I sprayed it. I know. So I sprayed it some more now. Our, our whole yard kind of smells like death. I know (laughs) it's going to keep those deer. I have like eight or nine deer just walking by all the time. And speaking of speaking of deer, if anyone listening is currently struggling with deer or pests in their garden, you must scroll back down the feed and listen to the 90 minute interview I did with Brie on pest control. She has so many amazing solutions for how to deal with deer, how to deal with moles, voles, rabbits, like all of it. So if you're struggling, we see you, we hear you, we're struggling alongside you and go listen to that episode. I do realize we do deal with, you know, insects inside, but I'm really happy that the deer are outside because I've, you know, I don't need them to eat my orchids or anything. Yes, absolutely. I don't take my plants outside. Absolutely. Yeah, me neither. I have one monstera I put outside this year, but um, that's more just because I didn't have space indoors for it in this, in this home that we're in. But back to blooming plants, we touched on orchids. I also have an orchids 101 episode with Chris, the orchid expert. You can scroll back and deep dive into orchids because Lisa and I are not orchids, orchid experts, but you are a blooming houseplant expert. So let's talk about best blooming houseplants for beginners and for intermediates. Like, what do you feel like Every beginner plant parent should have blooming on their windowsill if they want to get into flowers. Okay. So if you have high light, a crown of thorns can be in bloom and I love them can be in bloom. Three, I, I have one that's in bloom 365 days a year on my West windowsill. So a crown of thorns and they come in all kinds of colors. I love them. Hoyas. I have, I have one, two, three. I have four Hoyas in bloom right now. 
but you know, I've had them for a while, you know, so once they're mature, I feel like it's blooming, especially that Hoya platicata, clata, platy clata. Anyway, it's blooming all the time. I feel like Tillandsias. If you have Tillandsias in the right light, and that is a big thing with me. Everybody's like, oh, these Tillandsias, I can just put them anywhere. They need a lot of light. Yeah. You know, and then mine are com- com- almost constantly blooming and, pr- you know, making, getting bigger because once they bloom, they slowly pass away, but not before they've sent out new pups. So those are really great, especially I like hang them in, you know, glass balls in the, in the windows. So they don't take up any space, right? <laughs> They're just hanging space. I think that holiday cactus are really easy. <gasps> Underrated plant. Underrated. Underrated. Plant. The, ho- yes. the holiday, whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter cactus, it's an amazing plant. I, I love it. Now, I will tell you, that's one thing we can talk about. Phototropism. You know, your plant leans to the light, right? But so you need to turn it all the time. But it's very important with Christmas, you know, holiday cactus because, or cacti, because if you don't turn it, then only one side will bloom. My daughter was so excited, got her, this was many years ago. Now she is like a houseplant expert, but um, she was like, it only bloomed on one side. Why? And I'm like, cause you didn't turn it because they bloom all the way around the plant. You definitely have to turn that all year round okay. until it sets buds. Um, but then with any plant, you know, you don't want it to lean toward the light. So that's an, I think that's an easy plant. I think African violets are easy, but some people say they just can't grow them. And I, I don't know why. <laughs> well, so you and I actually have an episode on African violets, a full hour on African violets. If you also scroll down the feed, but yeah, what do you feel like is the trick for African violets for someone who wants to try? It's that consistent moisture, right? And yes, sp- yes. Don't let them dry out. Don't let them dry right. out. I feel like that's where I fail. That's where I failed when I killed mine. And everybody that, that I, like I'm in an African violet society and a lot of them, most of them, you know, the ones that have the, in my book, there's the, every, each book has the same picture of my friend's house with her violets and they always look the same, but they're always wick watering so that, you know, they're constantly moist. There's no drying out as long as you don't let the reservoir dry out. They also need to be repotted often because they get that long neck because they, the bottom leaves keep falling off. Yeah. So, you know, they get that long neck and all you got to do is repot them. They need to be repotted usually every six months to a year. So to keep that neck, we call it a neck, the long stem from getting long. And you just keep putting it back down and, you know, like if it's an inch long, cut off an inch of the bottom and, you know, bury it back in the ground and it'll send out roots and keep moving. Yeah. And they're easy to propagate too. Yeah. So all you need is a leaf. I will say with my African violet, I inherited a violet from a friend. It didn't bloom for years because I had it. so dark. I mean, I, this was in the beginning of plant parenthood where I like really did not understand my lighting environment. The minute I put it under my grow light, it started blooming like all the time. It was amazing. Yes. Yes. It's all uh, blooming plants. It's all about light. It really is. I moved it and I stopped watering it as regularly as it needed. And that's what did it in. But um, man, that was a joyful time when, when it was always blooming. It was so exciting every time. They are. They're beautiful. Yeah. Nothing like something that always blooms. Yeah, seriously. It's it's so joyful. Also, if you're a mindful plant parent, African violets are great because you you can kind of dote on them a little bit more with a, with a, a heavier schedule. Yes. And you know what? When you say African violets, another you know group of plants, it's this, it's this, all their cousins, all the gisnerias, the columnias, the ascananthus, nematanthus, you know, the little goldfish plant. All those plants are amazing and they bloom with, you know, not a ton of light. Like if you have an east window, you're going to get all of those are going to bloom. I think the goldfish plant is so fun for kids because yes. my inner child lights up when I see it. Yes. It's just like those, and your inner face immediately turns into a fish face, right? Yes. <laughs> so for those listening who don't know, it's a plant. I feel like you normally see it in hanging baskets. Yes. And what's its Latin name? Ne- uh, Nematanthus. Um, Oh gosh, don't Nematanthus something. But uh, yes, I can't think of it right now. It has bright orange goldfish shaped, literally shaped like goldfish blooms. And it looks like a, a sea of goldfish swimming when it's when it's in bloom. It's so fun. And I just think it would be so fun for if you have kids to like put it in their room or something to like have your little and, goldfish plant. And that one takes a little less water. It's that you treat more, a little more like a succulent, I've learned. Mm-hmm. I've over. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Consistent watering goes a long ways too. Consistent, yeah. not let it dry out to a, and then water and dry out and water. <laughs> Any yeah. plant doesn't like that. Yeah, because I feel like I'm way more prone to underwater to the point of death than I am to overwater to the point of death. Me too. That I have sense. too many plants to do that. It's got. Yeah. I've, I've seen a few more gnats flying around here since 
I've been home a lot more because yeah. I have a lot more time to dote on my plants. Yeah, yeah, so totally. They get a little too much water sometimes. So, okay. So to recap, we've talked about goldfish plant. We've talked about holiday cactus, African violets. What about the peace lily? How do you feel? Ab- and anthurium too. I love my anthurium blooms. Yes, I do love them. I can be honest. I haven't really, I don't know if I've ever had one rebloom for me, but it's not my favorite plant. So I don't really have them mm-hmm. too often. So they are beautiful though. That patent leather ugh, look is, is gorgeous. So, so those are great beginner plants, like everybody, and also super accessible. You can get them at the grocery store. Oh, yeah. You can get them yes. at the nursery. You can get them everywhere. Yeah. And I love peace lily. Some people, you know, I, I have one, I have a variegated one blooming right now and a regular one blooming in my very low light bathroom. Amazing. <laughs> I was amazed that it bloomed in there. Really. Amazing. Okay. So what about intermediate plants? So, uh, these are great, you know, accessible for the beginners, but what about, you know, our members of our community that are intermediates, they've done African violets, they've done an orchid, like what's a, what's a fun, more unique blooming plant that someone could try? Well, I definitely think if you're, if you're done, like when we say done, have done orchids, I'm thinking just the, you know, the moth orchid, the phalaenopsis orchids, but there's a lot more orchids out there to try, especially if you are an intermediate and want to try something different. There's dendrobians and cattleyas and melatonias, you know, just so many more that you could try. So there, that's definitely a, a thought. I'm trying to think what else is intermediate. I kind of think, I don't know if I think Hoyas are easy. I just think it takes a while for them to bloom sometimes. And that gets people a little, you know, yeah. not so excited about them. Epiphyllums, like my ox, oxapella, my queen of the night is getting ready to bloom. But I've also found, and there's a greenhouse uh, close to here that has them and, you know, regular epiphyllums, like the ones that are big and colorful. Mm-hmm. And she like, literally they are, that's where you, the cold comes in to some of these plants. A lot of cacti need cold before they'll bloom again. Right. You don't want to water them when they're cold by any stretch. I've done that before, but they like that cold as long as they have enough light, you know, they want to be cool. And that's an epiphyllum. Definitely. That's something where you would have to have a place where it's going to be cold. I mean, like she has it up against her greenhouse when, greenhouse edge and they don't have had ice on them, she said before, <laughs> and they just bloom like crazy. Wow. So they really like it cool. I wouldn't say put ice on them, but she's not had a problem. So um, some of those are a little harder. I think getting like, if you have, and maybe this is just me, but if you have bromeliads, like the ac- acmea, you have to, you know, it blooms. You buy them always buy those in bloom and they bloom for a long time. And then they die back like a tillandsia. And that, but not before they send out new babies at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So then to get those, you know, take good care of them and get them in bloom again, could be a a little intermediate Mm -hmm. to me. So that's another plant that might be more intermediate. I, for some reason, I can't get a clivia to rebloom for me. I've done it a couple of times. I think those are another plant that likes to be cool in the winter and have a rest. You know, some of these plants need rests, dormant periods, like cacti, like those epiphyllum the clivia before they'll bloom again. So I have so many plants out in my sunroom that I can't like, there's not a cold spot. I can put them on the floor because that's pretty cool, but I'm not very, I just kind of keep it warm out there because I have begonias and, you know, warm loving plants out there. You know, I ha- I have a collection of house plant books from the seventies. The Gerber Daisy is in like every house plant book from the seventies, the Gerber Daisy. And I'm like, is that a house plant? <laughs> I've never gotten it. I can barely get that stupid thing to crawl outside. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, it likes, it likes heat. I, I've never had, it. I've never, there's a lot of house plants in um, some of the uh, older books. And I'm like, really? I can't, I can't believe that you've got that to grow inside. So I've never gotten a Gerber. I see them like at the grocery store and stuff. And sometimes I'm like, oh, they're so happy. I mean, they're such happy plants, but I'm like, I just feel like if I bring that home, I'm going to kill it. You know? Yeah. I think it wants to be outside like an annual. Yeah, definitely. At least in my, my neck of the woods, I guess maybe it's a perennial in, I don't know, Florida. A lot of, a lot of our house plants are right. But I I don't, I have never tried that as a house plant. Okay. So we clear, we clear the air there. Okay. Final question. Is there a way we can get their blooms to last longer? Um, Yes, definitely. When you have a plant in bloom, do not let it dry out. Right. Okay. Because once you let it dry out, the first thing that's going to wilt is, are the flowers. Okay. I, I, I will tell you that's true. And so keep it well watered. I don't put it in the hottest place in your home. Like if it's starting to bloom, even if you had to put it in the windowsill to get it to bloom, you know, like the south windowsill, when okay. it starts blooming, move it back a little bit. Because once the blooms are there, they're already, it's already set. It's going to bloom. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't need, it doesn't need that light anymore. Like you, when a phalaenopsis orchid's in bloom, you can move it, put it in your dark living room because the blooms are already there. You don't want to leave it there forever, obviously, because it still needs to photosynthesize, but yeah, just, you can move them around. Don't let them be hot. Don't let them dry out. Don't let them be too cold, but yes. So one other question about fertilizing, if a plant is about to bloom, is there a time around the bloom that we're fertilizing? Like, do I fertilize while it's in bloom or while it's not in bloom? Like, are there rules around that? Or it's more just like even fertilizer? Yeah, I would still fertilize it if it was in bloom. I don't think that's a problem. It's because remember those bloom boosters are going to help it, you know, be a stronger bloom. Yeah. Right. I think that's fine. Okay. I've never not done that. Amazing. Well, I'm definitely going to buy an African violet next time I go to the nursery. (laughs) Yeah, I've been resisting, them. but now I feel you've, you've sold me again on them. Um, they're and so beautiful. Yeah. What's your favorite, what's your favorite, favorite blooming house plant you have right now? Boy, that's so hard. I really love my African violets because of grandma, but my phalaenopsis orchids, boy, they make me happy every day. Yeah. And my Hoya. I see. I can't, no, I can't I, even no, choose. Totally. 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 <laughs> yeah. Whatever's blooming at the time. That's my favorite. One. <laughs> yeah. And it's like having a living bouquet all the time, right? The more all the time. plants you have, yeah. blo- the, the more blooming plants you have in your collection, the more chance that you're always going to have something in bloom and a flower to yes. light in. If people want to dive deeper, your book is so helpful. And it's an entire book dedicated to blooming house plants, how to get them to bloom, how to keep them blooming, all the more, you know, deep dive. This was kind of the surface level conversation. So tell us the name of the book, where we can get it, when it's coming out. It is called Bloom. It is coming out August um, 9th. You can get it on my website if you want a signed copy, but it's all pre-order right now. You can pre-order, you know, on Amazon, on Barnes and Nobles, you know, all those places. Amazing. And we'll make sure to link in the show notes and man, author to author. I can't believe this is your fourth book. I have such respect for that (laughs) because I don't know what I'm thinking. (laughs) I'm still reeling from writing my first ones. I know. And this is like my first year. This is like the first summer in years I haven't been writing a book and I'm like, Whew, what do I do with myself? This is yeah, great. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh my God. So impressed. And yeah, I got a sneak peek at the book and it's awesome. And yes, thank def- you for reviewing it. I appreciate that. Thank oh you. yeah, of course. I will <laughs> definitely be referring to it as I grow more blooming plants because I totally this summer am hooked on flowers. So I'm not going to be able to wait until next summer to grow more flowers. So I'm bringing this right. hobby indoors. That's right. Everyone needs to have a little green in their lives and flowers. Yes. And also Lisa is houseplant guru on Instagram and socials. If you want to go follow her over there and thank you as always, Lisa, you're such a fun repeat beloved guest of Bloomer radio. Thanks for stopping by again. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this wonderful conversation. She totally got me inspired to invest in my blooming houseplant collection. Her book is great. If you are interested in this, I highly recommend it. It's beautifully designed. It's got all sorts of gorgeous photos and tons of information. It's going to be linked in the show notes as well as Lisa's social handles and her newsletter. I personally love Lisa's newsletter. <laughs> I, I read it every time she sends it out. She's, she's awesome. We love Lisa. So now at the end of this, I just wanted to share this really emotional thing that happened to me that was connected with houseplants that bloom. So I feel like, how do I not share the story with you guys? So by the way, I just came out with my own book. It's called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. And it's a self-help book. It's a self-care book about plant care. So my book and Lisa's book would be fabulous partners together on a bookshelf. If you've read the book, you know that I come from a lineage of Italian gardeners and that my grandparents, who I call Nonni and Nunu, were Italian immigrants. So I grew up in New York going to my grandparents' house in Queens to see their enormous garden and their sunroom that was filled with plants. My Nonni was a epic gardener and plant lady. Their house, they actually had two plots of land next to each other, one for their house and one for their garden. She had the most incredible garden. But back then, as I discuss in my book, I was something called plant blind, otherwise known as plant bias. And I didn't really care about plants. I had no interest in really getting to know how to garden with my grandmother or how to take care of her houseplants because I just didn't see them. I didn't care about them back then. And my grandparents sadly both passed away over a decade ago. And for some reason, I think it was because we used to visit when I was so young, I have no visual memories of this little basically greenhouse that my grandma had and a sunroom that she had at the front of the house. 
I remember walking into it and it being filled with plants, but I don't remember the types of plants that were in it. The only thing that I do remember is I have a very distinct scent memory to the smell of geranium leaves. So anytime I smell the smell of geranium leaves, I'm immediately transported to my grandma's sunroom. I also talk about this in depth in in my book, Growing Joy. And, you know, if I think about it now, I I really, I think about my grandma and my grandpa, Nani and Nanu, self-made immigrants. They came over with nothing. My grandma barely spoke English. My grandpa, like, has the most amazing story. And if you're interested in hearing about it, I can save that for another day. I think my mom would probably be better to tell his story, but he has the most incredible story of, of truly achieving the American dream, coming over, surviving the war with nothing and building something incredible. And I kick myself when I think about the fact that I grew up, you know, with these grandparents that were so connected to plants and amazing gardeners and had so much to share. And I just wasn't open to it because I I didn't see the value there. And they passed away. And now that I am obsessed with plants and I've dedicated my life to helping people care for them, I just sometimes wish that, you know, I had my grandma that I could call up. I'm very fortunate that I have my mom, but I think about that and not to get too woo woo, but I have felt very guided by my nani and nunu in the last couple of years. I am not a particularly religious person. I'm a spiritual person and I believe in the afterlife and I feel my grandparents with me as I grow this business and as I show up to this podcast and yeah, I just feel their support. I feel the I feel them with me in this journey with with Bloom and Grow as I bloom and grow. And I think about their sun porch and their garden often. And I wish that I had photos and memories that I could recall better. And this morning, I was going about my business and I got a text from my aunt with four photos of plants in my grandma, my nonny's sunroom. And it knocked me off my feet. I immediately burst into tears. And what I saw were these photos of plants in the sunroom. All of a sudden, memories came flooding back to me and she grew all plants that bloomed. She grew cyclamen, all sorts of Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter cactuses. They had a epiphyllum, oxypetalum, uh, queen of the night cactus, which is actually a plant that I write about in the final chapter of my book, Growing Joy. But she was a plant lady. She was a blooming plant lady. She was a flower mama. Um, Almost every plant in her sunroom bloomed. And she had African violets. And then all of, of course, like I mentioned, all of these geraniums. And I've always felt a little pulled to these houseplants that bloom. I frankly have not collected many of them. But after I've seen these photos, I've made a decision that I am going to buy a cyclamen next time I'm at the plant shop. I am going to start cultivating a little collection of houseplants that bloom, not just because blooming houseplants are beautiful, but because they're going to help me feel more connected to my nonni and have her be a part of my experience growing plants. And what I've learned, plant friends, plants are so emotional. Houseplants and gardening is so emotional. So many of us have these connections to our parents, our grandparents, the deceased, or the living, right? There are fabulous ways to make new friendships and to, and to foster relationships, but also there are ways to connect us to generations that we never knew because we all come probably from gardeners and farmers, right? Our ancestors were all connected to nature probably more than we were. And our ability to reconnect with nature is also tugging at that thread that connects us to those who aren't with us anymore. So before I start crying, I'm going to wrap the story up. Uh, But I know that you can, if you're following me on Instagram, I bet you will start seeing more blooming flowers because I can't wait to collect them for my nani in honor of her and in connection with her. And I hope that this episode helps you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. 
It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow Radio guest, Leslie Halleck, all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly node of knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly growing joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot 
take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 